But anybody want to know about creating free money, even though you've heard it before, how about that? Is that good? Okay, so there's my disclaimer. You guys read it, right? Good. Okay, I always want to, I always want to warn people because this is something that hasn't been talked about, but please do your due diligence. Obviously, you have to do due diligence. You know how to do financial due diligence. Is that correct? Everybody understands that? You know how to check out a note, the collateral, the paperwork, the, the borrowers, and the property, right? But it's not only the property or the note that you have to do due diligence on. It's the people you have to do due diligence on. And I could tell some stories, and you would be like awestruck that I misjudged people quite that badly, okay? <laughs> so due diligence on the note, the property, and also on the people you're doing business with. That's including your self-directed IRA provider and everything else. So I just want to throw that up there and kind of remind people. Okay, so I'm kind of, as I said, embarrassed to be up here among this massively talented crowd of people, but I'm going to give you my little view of the world and uh, then discuss some issues that I didn't get to in my other talk of negativity, right? <laughs> so I couldn't resist throwing in there one of my favorite investments is this 0% interest note. It's perfect. Wouldn't you guys agree? Wayne, no, it's not perfect, Wayne. Pretty. Now, now wait a minute. Did you guys not listen to the presentations before this, right? Is it perfect, Don? Of course, anything. It's absolutely perfect. There's never a discrepancy about how much she owes me. I don't have to worry about sending a 1098 or whatever the hell that form is, right? It's, everything's fine. And do you think I paid full price, face value for the note? No. Yeah. yeah, I probably did. Wrong. <laughs> so I paid $19,000 for the note. So how much money, Patty, am I going to make? It's real tough. Hurry. $14,000. Only took her 30 seconds to figure that out. <laughs> Now, how much am I going to make, Patty, if she pays it off tomorrow? $14,000. $14, so I think that's a pretty safe bet, don't you think? It's not too bad. Zillow, who we know is extremely accurate, says it's worth $127,500. Do you think the lady... And let's, let's assume it's worth half of that. Is the lady going to default on this note? And my yield, if she pays it all the way out, is 13.3%. Is that bad? No. It's, it's not a home run, I admit it, but it's a pretty safe, secure investment, and it's in my health savings account. So does your health savings account make you 13.3% on one $19,000 investment that's never, ever going to go south, ever? I say that's a base hit. It's not a home run, but you know what four base hits are, right? It's a run, right? And you've got to keep your money moving. And I think this is a great investment. And she, she gets into trouble. She calls me. She's not a perfect payer, but she always gets me the money, and she's very responsive, and I appreciate it. So now we're going to go to something completely different. Oh, that's how I calculated my yield is you can see that I bought 110 payments at $300 each, but I only paid 19000 for that income stream, so that's a 13.229% yield on the investment. And one of the points I wanted to make is that when we talk about yield, we're talking about two distinct elements, aren't we, Don? Yeah. Right? We're not really, when we say... Uh, the one thing that I kind of disagree with when people say, what's your interest rate? That's not true. What your yield is, is a combination of the interest that you receive on the note, in this case zero, and the discount. So it should be said, what's your yield on the investment, okay? Okay, so uh, everybody was asking questions about wraps. So I want to give you an example that I did of what I call a classic wrap. And a classic wrap is a seller finance device, okay, where there's an existing, a pre-existing first lien loan, 
and then the seller sells the house and wraps that first lien loan with a second lien loan that includes the payments on the underlying loan. That's a classic wrap, not what Walter creates, and I'll get to that next. So let's see how this works. In, in 2002, I bought a house, and I bought it subject to the existing mortgage, okay? And so I, when I took it over, the balance was 53000 uh, 958.83, and everybody understands that, right? I just took over payments. They were paid to Chase Bank, so I made her payments for 18 months, okay? And she had already paid, it was a 15-year note, and she paid 142 payments of the 15 years, okay? So I'm sorry, just the reverse. She paid 38, and there were 142 remaining. Okay, so... Has anybody looked at the difference between a 30-year AM schedule and a 15-year AM schedule? It goes, it amortizes a lot faster, doesn't it? So uh, the interest rate was 6%, which I know is horrible for everybody today, but back then it was pretty good, actually. And the payments on the principal and interest on the payment on the underlying loan was 563, 60, 560, 3163, sorry to keep turning my head. Maybe I should stand over here. Uh, okay, so everybody understands that, right? Then I sold it as is, where is. It was the worst house on the best street in the neighborhood. I sold it a few months later on 6-13-2002. And, and, oh, there you go. I sold it for $80,000 with a $9,000 down payment, which went to largely offset the money that I had to use to catch up the mortgage and the holding costs. So I really kind of zeroed out on that. And $71,000, 20-year financing, 240 months at 10%. Right? The underlying loan was at 6%. The wrap loan, which included that, as a 10%. So uh, how am I doing? I'm making money here. And the monthly principal and interest was 685.17. I don't know if you, this thing goes backwards. Oh, okay, now that if you compare 685 to 531, you can see that I'll make a small margin each month. Everybody with me so far? Yeah. Okay, so Every time I put the first few months up here of the new loan, every time that they made a payment on the wrap note, I took that money and took, deducted the money out that I owed Chase, and I applied it to Chase, and I kept the difference. But every time I made a payment, because of the rapid amortization of the first, I got $265 principal pay down and $93.50 on my loan. Can you see what's happening? Every month, I'm gaining in equity over $172 a month on the deal. That's the concept of a wrap. That's the classic wrap. The interest rate does not have to be the same. The term does not have to be the same. The only thing that a wrap is is something that basically includes an underlying lien. So everybody follow that? Yep. So I kind of wanted to put that up there. So what happened... Uh, oh, so they went for about 18 months and then they refinanced the property and that was in 2003 Is that just it's just out years? of juice and anyway the principal balance had on the first had dropped from 53 to 48 but my balance didn't only drop from 71 to 69 mm -hmm. you see what happens there um, so my wrap equity at payoff is twenty thousand nine hundred and forty dollars. Oh, thank you very much. This is this is non-alcoholic beverage. Prune juice. Because <laughs> you're full. Of yeah, that, that makes me feel better. Whoa! I feel good now. I feel good. Na 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 na. Okay. Don is furnishing a lot of booze back there, so help us out. Uh, well, okay, so the, gra the wrap equity uh, started off at 17 and grew to over 20940 
And then I also got $153 a month times 16 months for another 2,456. So my total profit on the wrap deal was 23,397.63. And think about what I did. I actually made a little profit on the $9,000 down payment, but I didn't calculate that in there. So it's probably more like 25 or $26,000 that I made on the deal. So how much of my money was involved? And that none. after I got the $9,000 down payment, none. 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 Whose money did I use? The, bank. the bank's money and the p person that was paying the RAF's money. I mean, is that cool or what? <laughs> I mean, that's what RAPs are. Now, let's contrast that because I, I wanted you to have an, a distinction between a classic RAP, which is what this is, again, a seller finance device, and what crazy Walter Wofford does. Okay. Now what Walter does is what I call a simultaneous wrap, where he creates both the underlying note and the wrap note at the same time and are signed by the same borrower. Obviously in the first case, there was an underlying note signed by uh, the seller of the property that I took over right before foreclosure, right? In yours. And in my classic example, the correct example, I'll let Walter answer that question later, okay? So, but with Walter, he creates both at the same time. So this is a deal that Walter and I actually did. I believe that's the actual house, isn't it, Walter? Yeah. Yeah. So he could acquire this house for $27,000. And the buyer, he had a buyer lined up to purchase it for $48,000 with $4,000 down and a $44,000 note, right? Everybody kind of follow that? Mm -hmm. Now, how's Wally doing so far? But what's the problem with constantly providing seller financing? You've got to have what? You've got to have cash. So Walter doesn't like to use his own money. In fact, to my knowledge, he's never, ever used his own money for anything. So, yeah, I know. He uses me like a freaking ATM, I swear. So... Anyway, this was Walter's deal, so he also wanted a little change to put in his pocket. So he created, or we created, agreed to create a $31,000, a $31,000, 7.75%, 103 payments of 414, 16 each. And that was enough to cover the, the acquisition price, the closing costs, any unknown repairs, so let's just assume the whole end was 27,000. What's Wally getting so far? Four grand from what? The down payment and what else he get? Four grand from the difference between 30, 31 and 27, right? Only problem is he needs somebody to put up the money, right? He come to you. Of course he did. So he came to me. And how's that for a first lien note? How is that? It's 7.75%, can a normal human being off the street get 7.75% right now? No. Yeah. No. Uh, not no. typically. Most of them don't have any idea where they could get that kind of yield. Is it a fairly safe investment? Yes. Think about it for a minute. It's fairly safe. If you think it amortizes rapidly at 15 <coughs> years versus 30, what about eight years? It goes very, or eight and a half years or so. It goes very rapidly. So everybody kind of understand the concept? Mm -hmm. But he needed uh, the 31000 you know. So what Walter did is he connected with his network, right? Are you all getting the concept that a network is the most critical element that you can have? Because it is not, contrary to popular belief, that you need money. You just need access to money. It is not that you have need deal flow. I have very little deal flow. I do have deal flow, but very little de deal flow myself. However, I have a network, so I have access to deal flow. Does everybody kind of follow that? Yeah. That's networking. So he reached out to me, and he'll tell you, but he was just trying to feed me crack cocaine. I'm not sure how he knows so much about that, but it is Mississippi, so maybe... <laughs> 
anyway, he reaches out to me and says, Quincy, do you know somebody that will put up the 31,000? And what he would say today, I think, is, Quincy, can you put up the 31,000? <laughs> no, listen to the difference. Can you put up the 31,000 and I'll do something for you, which I'll tell you about next. And what does he mean by that? Does he mean it has to be my 31,000? Or does it just mean that I have to turn around and access my network mm -hmm. to find somebody that would put up the 31,000? You understand the difference? Mm -hmm. So I said, let me check. So it took me literally less than 10 minutes to find somebody who thought that was a very acceptable deal. So I, said, I called him back and I said, Walter, I got the 31,000 you need. What are you going to do for me? So he created the $44,000 as a wrap payment and created 180 payments of, my golly, it's 4, 14, 16 each. It's a miracle, right? <laughs> and if you have a financial calculator, it's not at all hard to do this once you get practice at it. So he created it. Now, in my other scenario, was there an exact match before or did I get a little cash flow? So you don't have to do it as an exact match. When Walter talks about a simultaneous wrap, he uniformly, so far as I know, always creates an exact match. I won't necessarily say you have to do that, so I just wanted to point that out, okay? So he creates this, and he agrees to sell half of the wrap for $500 to whatever account I want to have it in. Everybody follow that? Mm -hmm. And so I put the $500 in my daughter's, or took the $500 from my daughter's Roth IRA. Now think about that for a minute. Just, just hang on, just think about that for a minute. So Wally's got $8,000. He sold me half the wrap. How much does Wally have in this deal so far? <laughs> Negative $8,000, right? What else, even though he gave up half of the wrap, what else does he have? He has 77 payments of 208, or 20. Uh, whatever, two of 708 each, starting eight and a half years from now, when he's too old and decrepit to do anything. <laughs> Everybody follow that? Now, did Wally do okay? Uh, because I will tell you something, that investing is a team sport, and one of the most best, most wonderful t-shirts we ever created was for this last cruise. Do you agree with that, Don? And the phrase on the cruise was, Good uh, friends don't let friends invest alone. Financial friends. Fin I'm sorry, financial friends don't let friends invest alone, okay? And that is, that is true, and it's so much what the Financial Friends Network is all about. It's connecting friends and doing financial transactions with each other because I like pie. I don't know about anybody else like pie. Mm -hmm. Only a few people. Uh, the people that like pie, do you like just one kind of pie or lots of kind I like of pie? apple and blueberry pie. Anybody else have any favorite? Oh, so you have multiple pies that you would like to get a slice of. I personally would rather have a slice of eight different pies and share the rest of the pie with my friends than try to eat one whole pie by myself. I know it's a mind shift. It's a paradigm shift for those of you who are not experienced investors to think like that but it's the most powerful way to do it. I now have a network that spans the United States. I invest in multiple states, not, and I would never ever do that with all due respect to Don and other people that do. I would never ever do that unless I had boots on the ground. Well, now I do. I have boots on the ground in a lot of places, and it's a very powerful thing. It's difficult to achieve, but we give you some help in the Financial Friends Network for that. You can make a point about that, <laughs> if you hurry. <laughs> All right, so we buy a lot of houses from people who built the house. That couple built the house uh, in, the, in the 60s. And so they live there. And what I like to do is when I have a buyer that I think wants it, I bring them in and let them ask oh. the owners what's wrong with the house. Now, how cool is that? Tell me everything about your house. And so, the, how much money did we spend repairing that house before we sold it? Zero. How much time did we have between the time we closed it and the new homeowners moved in? Zero, I think. That day. 
All right, so I never spent a dime on that house, not yeah. one. Well, there you go. He got the full eight grand then. Now, let me, uh, let me bring out one other point. But that's okay. Did I care, guys? Did I care that we made 8000 and that I, I made a pittance on the deal? <laughs> no, I mean, I didn't care at all because that's what it's all about. We, I helped create wealth for him. He helped create wealth for me. I would have never had the deal. And I put it in my daughter's Roth IRA. Now, I want to ask you something. Why in the hell would I put this in my daughter's Roth IRA? Why would I do that? Am I ever going to see the benefit of that money? Ever? No, but she will. No, but she will. Wouldn't it have been better to put it in a Coverdell Education Savings Account? No, this is tax free. Oh, it's tax free in the Coverdell, too, as long as you use it for education experience. Why do you think I did this? Which daughter? The older one? Or the, the older one. The older one. What year of college is she in? She's a junior this year. Her kids. So the reason is that I was stupid and didn't really think through the part that I knew about Coverdells. I'm, I'm trying to share a mistake because I'm nothing if not honest, okay? When my mama wanted to know what really went on in the house, she just asked me, okay? Because I'll tell the truth and hold the truth and nothing but the truth whether it helps me or not. So I'm telling you I was stupid and I should have worked my daughter's Coverdell accounts a lot harder than I did. But at this point, it was too late. She was already going to college when this deal took down. Now, why else? Why then wouldn't I put it in my account? Why wouldn't I do that? Because I don't need it. And at some point, as Sherry said, you've got to start thinking about transference of wealth to the next generation. That's part of my plan. When I, I try to work my kids' accounts as quickly as I can and as much as I can, because I'm not going to need the money. Everybody got it? And even if I do, I'd rather have them have it than the government. Okay, now, could we have done this same deal any other way? Yes, I promised you that yesterday. So same scenario. Oh, this is what my daughter's yield looks like, by the way. Even though she gets nothing for 103 payments and she put $500 out, right? And then she gets 77 payments at 207.08. That gives her annual yield of 30.97%, and that's including in the eight and a half years that she gets nothing, because the equity is growing. You see the difference at first starts at 31, but the equity grows, not shrinks, until she gets the whole, well, her half of the payments, and then it goes down in like a normal amortization. Does everybody see that? Did she do okay? Okay, so was that worth seeing? I hope so. Oh, God, here we go. <laughs> I'll refill your wine. Here. Thank you. <laughs> no, this is okay. Uh, I'm, I'm like the, the sports announcer to give him a play-by-play, play, right? Um, so what most people do, including my parents, was they pile up the money to leave to the kids. They don't tell the kids what they got. And they pay, you know, the, they pay taxes all along the way, right? Right. And then you inherit it don't know what you got that's that has been that's the prior generations model right not our model not our model and so what we would rather do is have an estate net worth this size and then start building up all our family members absolutely which is what he just did yep so another way we could have done the same deal is because i promised you four different ways right now, mind you that this is a Walter special, so that means that what he was doing is creating a win-win scenario, or in this case, a win-win-win scenario, right? In which case, the tenant buyers, now homeowners, could pay, what, $150 or $200 less a month than they were paying as rent? Is that a recipe for success <laughs> for both sides? It is. So keeping that in mind, he backed into the payment that he needed them to be at to arrive at the 414 number, okay? So same deal. So if we're working with $414 a month and 16 cents or whatever, well, that's the number we're going to try to stick with no matter which of these techniques we use. Does that make sense to everybody? So same scenario. We could have just created one $44,000 note 7.75%, 180 payments of 414.16 each, correct? Mm -hmm. And then we could have done what? 
oh, it's cheating up there. We could have sold the first 103 payments to raise the $31,000 that Wally needed for that deal. Does that make any change to the homeowner? No. no. Does it make a difference to Wally and me? He's got no money. Well, I, I'm just going to confess that I, have, I would rather have two separate notes than one note that a partial has been sold off on. Okay, because I, well, I'm not going to go into that because I won't have any time, but ask me about it later. So we could have done that same deal a different way. Is that all you can do? Well, hell no. You could also do what we call the two-noter model. And in the two-noter model, we create the same $31,000, I don't know what I'm holding this for, the same $31,000 note that we talked about in the way we actually did it. The wrap was the way we actually did it. And we create a second note of $13,000, but on the $13,000 difference, which happens to be exactly the difference between 44 and 31, so it's the same debt, and that has 77 payments of 4, 14, 16 each, but the payments don't start until the first pays off. So is there any need to worry about reconveyance of the mortgage or anything like that? No, because the first one is dead at the time that the second one comes up. Now, there's only one, there's a disadvantage of this, and I want Walter to get up and talk about this, is that with this situation, you have to have a, a schedule where the interest is added back into the principal each month to make it come out just right on the amortization. So that's, if you're dealing with a homeowner, that can be a situation that is probably not Dodd-Frank compliant, okay? So, but go ahead, Walter, and comment on why you do the difference between a wrap or a two-year Well, model. and I flip-flop back on which one I like better today. You know, you wake up on this side of the bed. I like the wraps better because in the past, wraps are harder to explain than two notes. I always, when, they I'm, are. Sitting, when I'm sitting down with the buyer, I, I draw a line. All right, here's the first. You won't have any double payments, and here's the second. And, there, and I tell them the reason we do that is because my, if, if I ever needed to sell the note, that first is easier to sell, and they understand that. It's a lot easier to sell than a, a uh, partial. Because, you know, we don't have to have a contract as you do with the partial. You don't have to have really, I mean, it's, you, it's a little more sophisticated to sell a partial, and that's fine. But uh, have you ever read every word of a partial agreement? Very few people have done. Why don't you go read one and then go try to explain it to a civilian? It's hard to do. Well, not only that, there's another issue. That with a wrap, you're asking them to sign a $31,000 note and a $44,000 note and getting them to understand that, wait a minute, I'm, I thought I was paying you know, a $44,000 loan and trying to explain that no, the 31 is included in the 44 can be a bit complicated. So I'm, well, either one is more complicated. I, than I'm just note. saying that there's another way to do it. But is that the only way you can do it? Thank you, Walter. May I sit down? You're dismissed. <laughs> Is that the only way you can do it? We're giving you three ways now. Is there any other ways you can do it? You could do the same thing and create a first lien of 31000 at 6%, which is less than the interest rate, and create a second at 11.5%. The numbers are exactly the same. But you have a first that runs the whole 180 months, and you have a second that runs the whole 180 months, okay? But the total of the payments is the same. Now, if you could convince somebody to, say, take a 6% yield, then that leaves whatever's left for the second, right? In this case, that would mean they could have 152.56 a month and still be at the same level, right? And in that case, the, the yield on the second would be 11.5 plus percent. Now. If you're a homeowner and you have money to pay it off, which one are you going to pay off first? Sure. Okay, I'm just pointing out that there's more than 100,000 ways to slice or dice the deal if you work backwards from what is the end in mind, in this case a payment of 414.16, and what do you, what, how can you slice or dice that 
to make it fit a transaction. There might be a situation where a wrap is more appropriate. There might be a situation where a two noter is more appropriate. There might, you know, you, I've given you four ways out of a hundred. Do you see how flexible notes are? Is that interesting or not? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so Winston, your daughter who, who basically bought that half interest in the second, right? She did. She bought it with good consideration of 500 bucks. All right, so you, you titled it in her name, right? No, I titled it in the trust, I believe. So you did. You did. That's what I'm, 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 the point I'm trying to make is everything we do is in trust. Everything. Did I say everything? Everything. everything. And by the way, because I have it titled in the trust, is it very, very easy to assign the beneficial interest if somebody wants to buy that note? Yes. Yes. Could I maybe even sell a partial of that note without disturbing the note at all? <laughs> yes. See how much flexibility we have? If we had a real estate deal, Walter, would we need a second closing? No. <laughs> no, we could just transfer the beneficial interest and the note stays in the same place. The title to the property stays in the same place. It may help you if somebody cashes you out with FHA financing because there's no, you know, there's no flipping of the title, right? Which is a big problem with FHA type financing. Could, could I five years from now sell three years of payment nothing <laughs> nothing is going to change on the record title okay uh, would you get through that example I got it. No, I'm done with that example All right, so look it's okay we're going How many together hours are we going now that no, we're going together on this question okay it's not, it's not a you and me you and me but. all right so we're after the cruise in Alaska we're sitting there um, basking in what a great time that we had sitting in a bar overlooking the Seattle Bay. Yeah. And I happened to get a contract, sent he might check my email, got a contract. So I held it up, Quincy, you want this? All right, so it was a it was a house. So this we're gonna tell you a real deal that's going down. It should have been consummated today, ended today, but it I'm not sure it has yet. Okay. All right, so I got a lead from a closing attorney he said I think you need to come look at this house. And, so, you know, why is it good to know your closing attorneys? We don't have really many escrow title companies in our area. So I said, sure, let me come look at it. Yeah, and it was a five-bedroom, three-bath house assessed for 160, owned by an attorney, got a divorce, okay? Cheaper to keep her. Uh, and... <laughs> He's, all right, so he had a lot of deferred maintenance on this house. What, the reason the attorney was involved was because the, I'm talking about the closing attorney, because the attorney owner had run up $50,000 in credit card debt. And the credit card companies had a judgment, a personal judgment that attached to the house. Did I mention why we use trust? Have I mentioned that yet? Because those personal judgments don't attach to the house most of the time. So he, I said, well, how did you get rid of those judgments? He said, I sued the credit card companies on behalf of the wife who's trying to get paid. You know, it, was a, it was a divorce settlement thing. So in Mississippi, and maybe other places, the first 75000 of your home primary residence equity is protected from creditors. Mm -hmm. Is that true in Texas? It's, it's unlimited in Texas. Do you have to file a homestead, or does it actually happen if it's a primary residence? Yeah, primary no, residence. It's primary, primary residence. Yeah. The tax exemption has nothing to do with it in, in Texas. No, but, but some places require you to file a homestead. I was just wondering. If, uh, Texas isn't one of them. I can't tell you about anybody else. All right, so he, he said, I got rid of the judgments. No problem. The house is ready to be sold, and it's in the name of the, the guy. Okay? So I went over there, and I said, after we walked through it, it needed a bunch of work. So the closing attorney and I went outside and he said, I said, what do you think? And he said, well, looks like it'll take about 50 to fix it. I said, that's my number two. I said, well, what do you think it's worth that to fix it? About 150, that's my number two. Now, we were really actually agreeing with this. So that means that <clears throat> I need to buy it somewhere around 50. He said, that sounds all right too. So he, he went and relayed that to the owner and so attorney, the closing attorney, who's now a negotiator, 
you can talk about some conflicts. All right, so. Oh, yes, and you don't have any of those. Never, do never, never. So he said, well, can you live with 55? I said, sure, that'll be fine. I got to get an inspection. And so that's what we did. We got one of those super duper inspections because I wanted somebody to tell me what's wrong with that house because I, knew I wasn't going to fix it. I didn't want to fix it. It had a pool, that kind of stuff. Big old house. Um, anyway, so we got the inspection, and I talked to the inspector. No, 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 no uh, bad things. It just needed cleaning out. And so we, so that's when I got the. I removed the contingency, and that's when I got the contract on my phone. Showed it to Quincy. And what you, what, how do you attract money? Is you get the greed glands going, and he's got them. You can see them. They're right there. <laughs> See what happens, folks, with the greed glands, and some people know how to push them. So they start swelling up until they choke your air off and squish your brains till you do something stupid or smart, <laughs> depending on how it turns out. So I don't ever do Quincy's calculations for him. I let, because he can do it at lightning speed. So I said, Quincy, why don't you put the money up? I'm going to need a couple of extra thousand to get the freak out of the house. You know, move up, you know what I'm talking about, clean up the yard. And so he said, I'll, I'll take it. And I said, I think the best thing we're going to do is put it on MLS and just sell it the way it is. And so it was listed last Thursday. Mm -hmm. we've, had to, we've had two offers on it already, one at 79 and one at 80. But, that's not, but wait, that's not good enough, is it? No, sir. All right, so I think we'll settle probably around 90 or 91, as is, no work. You happy with that? That's fine. All right, so how do you document that deal, the deal we made? So did I, did I say what the deal was yet? What do you think the deal was? There you go. He gets all the money and you get the praise. He gets, that's right, he gets all the praise. <laughs> I said, Jimmy, hey, Jimmy, I Jimmy, said, you're going to have to study these tapes a little better, everybody. <laughs> well, he's on it officially as the buyer. Yeah, all right, so how do you mm -hmm. think I took title? All right. Sure. That's who exactly what happened. Who's the beneficiaries of the trust? Well, who well, cares? I, I want to know. <laughs> well, we're not going to put that on tape. <laughs> but his initials are WW and HQL. <laughs> All right, so, so we decided that it was a 50-50 ownership of the trust, but that does not spell out how the money's going to be split necessarily, uh, right? All right, so we, what else did we have to have? We had to have... No, he wired the money. Oh, from your, it was his money. It was, well, yeah, it, it was the four hundred one k money. <laughs> <laughs> it was the four hundred one k money. It wasn't my personal you have money. Have to have an agreement. Oh, really? Well, we had an agreement. It just wasn't in writing. Oh, okay. Contract. So, what do we need besides the trust? Paper contract. A contract, exactly, Jimmy. You're getting close. What do we need, folks? Exactly right. Agreement. We need a joint venture agreement outlining how we're going to split the money up. And the, what do you think it says? It says, who gets the money first? Because you put it up. I put the, get the money first, and we split everything, and some percentage, okay, it's 50-50. <laughs> now, Walter gets his money, and how much did he put into the deal? Nothing. Negative nothing. nothing. <laughs> Am I okay? It, let's say I net $8,000 on the deal. Is $8,000 on $55,000 in one month okay? Yes. How's my yield doing on that, Don? Good enough. Good enough. But wait, you say I don't have anything in that deal? He has an intellectual property in there. I have well, 30 years of experience, relational capital, of dealing course, with of that course. attorney. He has no money in the deal. I got a lot he has the money deal. in the deal. <laughs> don't, let, don't let somebody complain about those $400 an hour attorney fees. You're not buying an hour, you're buying a career's That's experience. right. That's right. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that deal, Walter. Seriously. All right, so we, we're, we're going to close I mean it. that. I mean, Walter did a great job. I think we all can give him a hand. Walter's making a lot of money. Well, but I'm making him money, and that's okay because investing is a team sport. Switch your paradigm from trying to be a greedy bastard and take all the money into... Dumb. <laughs> greedy Don, greedy Abby, whatever. And switch your mind in thinking, how can we all make each other rich? Right. You'll do more deals and you'll get wealthier by far 
than if you try to eat a whole pie by yourself every time. Okay, so I promised you something else, right? I'm going to talk about selling the yield differential. Now, I feel really stupid about this because, you know, Kathy and Dawn are going to be like, Quincy, my God, you're just going to such simple things. But I want you to see, th these are stories. And doing a deal like teaching you how to use a calculator isn't a story. So I decided to embarrass myself and go ahead and come up here and do this anyway, okay? So this was a deal that Wally, Wally and I did. And Wally knew of a house that had fire damage. And it was a fire, I think, in the kitchen, but the smoke was just throughout the house, and it had to be gutted. Right, Walty? That's right. And he was uh, negotiated the sale. And how much was it listed for? for it was listed for $89,000, and then it burned. It was owned by an estate. an estate. Do you think that estate wanted to deal with a burned house? No. The answer is no. That was, oh, my God. What do we do now? So they sold the property for Wall to Wally for $14,000. And Wally immediately, of course, according to his habit, found somebody to buy it for $23,000, right? And fix it, yes. He had the skills, a down payment of $1,500 and a principal balance mortgage of $21,500. And the rate that he charged him was 7.75%. In only six years, this person who has the skills to fix this house was going to be the owner of the house. What do you guys think of that? That's pretty good, right? And then the monthly payment was three seventy four seventy five, and so then. But uh, did I mention that Walter doesn't like to use his own money? He curves to use Quincy's ATM machine here, <laughs> which is fine with me, by the way, Walter. Except for that deal that you gave me at five percent. Uh, so he calls me up and he says, Quincy, would you like to buy the 21.5 note for $19,000? Now, it doesn't take me long to do a calculation, it's just like he said. I can do that one, and that turns out to be a yield of 12.2925%. Are you starting to see a pattern here? That, to me, is a base hit. It's not a home run, but it's a solid deal, and it keeps my money working, right? So I said, sure, Walter, I'll take that. And I thought it was a good deal. By the way, the buyer, the borrower turned out to be a real pain in the ass, but that sometimes happens. So then I thought, oh, we were going on one of our IRA fund cruises or what we now call the Financial Friends Network cruises. And I said, you know, I, I mean, my yield is great on this thing. You guys would say it was an okay deal, right? I thought, what if I just wanted to sell the note? How could I sell the note what are my methods of selling the note? And I'm going to give you three models for selling a note and to show you not that those are the only three, but that the flexibility that you have in creating deals, okay? So I said the first thing I could do is to say, by the way, how's, the, how's that loan to value as he repairs that property? That's pretty amazing, isn't it, right? So it's a great loan to value, especially as he repairs the property. If you figure it was worth $80,000 before, that's amazing, isn't it? Should that be an easy note to sell? Could I have probably sold that note at par at 7.75 yes. yes. easily? But I was just being creative. And I, I will tell you that sometimes I'll just do a deal and spend hours thinking about it which is a waste of my time if you think about it, but I like to create models. I like to create methods of doing business, and then the next time it's just rinse and repeat. Everybody got that? So I said, well, what if I sold it at a 9% yield? I bought it at a 12.2925% yield. What if I just turned around and sold the whole note at a 9% yield? I, that mean, should mean that the buyer should be willing to take a smaller discount on the note of twenty thousand seven sixty seven seventy six and I get my nineteen thousand back, that would give me a profit of seventeen sixty seven seventy six. Okay, you're saying that's not much profit, but think of the model is what I'm trying to get you the technique, not necessarily the dollars. But is that okay? Yes. I mean, could I have simultaneously sold that note? Yes, sure. Sure I could have. Yes. Sure I could have. Easily, easily and stuck some money in my pocket. But that's not the only way you can sell it. I could also sell part of the income stream. In this case, it would take 
91.39% of the 374.75 or 342.49 to amortize a $19,000 uh, income stream at 9%. So if I did that, then I, my Roth IRA who bought this note, I, yeah, I guess it was my Roth, uh, that bought this note would cash flow $32.26 a month times six years of payments would get me a payment, a profit of twenty three, twenty two seventy two. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Could I have simultaneously done this? Yes. Could I have created money out of thin air? It's not thin air, it's my brains, right? Scrambled as they are. But that's not the only way you could do it, right? You could sell 64, 000, 64 payments out of the uh, 80 or the 72 payments and that would give them a yield of 8.9845% and I get to keep the last eight payments and that would give me a profit of $2,998 on the deal. So three different models and they're designed to just create whatever situation I wanted to create. Now if I was positing the situation that I needed, didn't have much money in the Roth, it's like say maybe oh, an inherited Roth IRA or something, which one of these do you think I would choose to do? The tax-free problem. They're all, they're all tax-free. <laughs> would I do number one? That would give me, uh, with very little or no cost, a profit of 1767. If I was willing to wait, I could get some cash flow. And suppose I only had $100 into the deal. Three months of cash flow, I get it at another $100, and I do it again and again and again or I could wait 64 payments. So what I decided to do is I offered to sell it on Model 1 or Model 2, and somebody said they were going to buy it at Model 1. Because Model 3, though it was acceptable in the same yield, was not acceptable to me. Does everybody kind of follow that? Yeah. So you structure the deals and the note deals. The advantage of creating the note is you get to do whatever the hell you want to with it, right? create whatever situation you want to with it. And I'm just trying to show you the flexibility. Any questions on that? All right. So now I'm going to show you another deal. This is a two-noter model. This is really slick, guys. Uh, two-noter model. Walter was going to sell me this $30,000 worth of financing on this particular house. It's a cute little brick house for $21,000, so there's $30,000 worth of financing. He was going to sell it to the homeowner for $32,500, they were going to put $2,500 down and finance $30,000. Everybody with me on this so far? Okay, so he said, you can buy that note, Quincy, for $21,000. Now, the payment stream was 80 payments of four eighty one thirty six. dollars again, $30,000 for 7.75%. Now, if I buy that $30,000 for 21, I'm getting a 30% discount on the note. Everybody, wants, right? But why would I ever sell that? Because if you think about it, if I this, these don't change if you're messing around selling a note, right? These don't change. The payment streams do not change, right? So those you leave alone. On this side is what you're messing with, right? But if I only paid 21,000 for that same income stream, that's over a 20% yield, isn't it? So why would I ever sell that? Well, why not? Maybe I need the money for another deal. Why would I sell it to you? Why would you? I'm not going to put that on the tape, Walter. <laughs> Nevertheless, that's what happened. But what I did is, what we decided to do is, instead of creating one $30,000 note with 80 payments, Walter suggested, why don't, why don't we build in some flexibility? Don't pay attention to this. If you're thinking about doing partials and stuff, pay attention to this. He said, let's create some flexibility from the beginning when we're creating this note. Instead of having one $30,000 80-month payment, why don't we break it down into two notes, one for a little over what you had to put in the deal and the rest on a second lien note. Did everybody follow that? Yeah. Now, what, now, I got a 20% plus yield. I probably wasn't going to sell it, I thought. But it's nice to have the flexibility, isn't it? Everybody follow what I'm saying here? So we created two notes. 
The first vote was a fully amortizing noted 21,885, 83, 7.75%, 54 of the 80 payments on this note. Everybody follow that? Yes. So I effectively am selling a partial of 54 payments out of 80, right? But I'm creating a second note, I mean, a firstly note to do that. Now, is that an easier thing to sell than a partial? Yes. yes. Because there's a couple of factors there. One, it, the document's easier to explain to somebody because this, there's nothing special about this. It's a fully amortizing 54-month note, right? Many people would go for that. Then we created a second lien note for 26 payments, 80, 81, 14, 17, 26 payments to 481, 36. Again, no payments for the first 54 months and then, and then uh, 26 payments of 481, 36. So what do you, how am I doing so far, guys? Then what do you think I did next? Sam Walter. After. <laughs> Thank you, Walter. So what, so what did I do next? I sold, listen, pay attention to this. I sold that first lien note for 21750 Now, how much did I pay for the $30,000 again? 21000 So now what's my cost in the deal? Minus... Ne negative 750 and what's the yield to the investor I'll just tell you it's a little over 8% no to the investor who bought the note now the investor's got a little yield of a little over 8% is that okay for most people is it a very safe note 54 payments amortizing that rapidly on a $30,000 uh, total worth of financing but a 21885 note that is just about as safe as you get it. If they foreclose on that property, they've gotten a property that somebody paid a lot more for, 325 for 21885. Is that good for them? Is that easy to sell a note like that? Yes, yes. They wanted a little over 8%, so I had to knock it down from 21885 to 21750. <laughs> okay? So what do I get the second lien note for? Zero. That sounds like free money to me. Am I meeting the obligation for the, the title? Okay, so now I'm going to talk about doing... Wait, 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 wait. Oh my God, here we go again. <laughs> Was that neat though? Yes. Does that give you guys a hint about creating flexibility from the beginning even if you never exercise that flexibility you build it in from the start. Yeah. Why would the buyer sign up for that? Why would the buyer care? The buyer's got the same number of payments at the same number, the same payment amount. They don't care. Does the buyer know that? Sure. Well, sure, sure. they signed the document. <laughs> Plus, they're well, not because they're getting well, out of finance. I'm, I'm sorry, the borrower of the, of the buyer. The, the buyer. The borrower. Buyer of the house. All right, so when you add, so two noter, then you add the complexity of a, taking title in a trust. Is easy to explain if you get on their level, their experience level. You yeah. want to protect yourself from judgments. Yeah. So we, I've I've fully explained this to Hispanic borrower with an interpreter, and they got it. All right. So this. So how about us? Are we going to get it? <laughs> The only problem is the interpreter spoke Czech and... Uh... <laughs> All right, so the, hang on just a second. The, so the reason we do this to note, you don't ever know when you got to cash something out. That's exactly right. Or you don't ever know when you want to trade something. If somebody That's right. Has, you got something like, for example, somebody's got an uh, Airstream that they want to get rid of and you happen to want one, right? Yeah. Why don't you just take this note? It's, it's safe. The second is behind it. So you got trading pieces when you do. And you, if you created one note and you wanted to take it to market, you'd have to take too big of a discount. Mm -hmm. Selling that first is a minimal discount. And I could have got the yield way up there above 8% if I did. That's what I built in. I said, what would I be willing to discount? So I said, if I have at least 
21,885, I can discount it all the way down to 21 and still have nothing in the deal. And it will be so easy to sell that. So I don't put the, the first lien note at exactly what I had in the deal. I need to build in some extra so that I have room for discounting to bring it up to a nice yield. Okay, and if you're wondering why the odd amount is because I'm an anal retentive lawyer and Walter liked to go like, oh, 54, that's, that's, that's approximately right, that's good enough. And for me, I'm like, no, we got to get it down to the penny. <laughs> so it exactly amortizes right because, damn it, I can't understand why you would take a half payment in the middle. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to talk about my final topic. Yes, I am going to finish at some point. And we're going to talk about my... So final topic is we talked about doing a joint venture. In fact, Walter just talked about doing a joint venture within a trust for a piece of property, did he not? Right? You can do the same thing with a note. You can do the same thing with a note. Okay? Why do I like to do joint ventures within a trust for a note? Well, nobody knows who the beneficiary is, right? If you went and searched under Walter Wofford, you wouldn't find a hell of a lot. He's got a number, well, I don't even know how many he's got because he never tells me because it's the, the, my, my joint venture, that's right, and I don't care. My joint venture partner and anything I do with Walter is a trust. I don't even know if any of them are his, nor do I care, right? But a trust provides anonymity. Nobody knows the beneficiary, right? Nobody knows who sees what's going on. Again, what I said earlier. Can I sell the payments 3 through 12? Yeah, I, I can do whatever I want to. Nothing happens with the note, right? So no one can see what's going on. No explanation is needed. Have you ever tried to explain a two-noter model or a wrap to an, a title company officer, other than Gail, of course, right? Is that complicated? Do they understand it? Does a confused mind say no? What about a single note that nothing is going on and they don't know who's behind it and they don't care? You see the simplicity factor there? No explanation. No worry about negative amortization because probably negative amortization on that second on a two-noter model is probably not Dodd-Frank compliant. Would you agree with that? But if it's not happening with the note, it's happening behind the scenes in a joint venture, is it all of a sudden compliant? It, of course it's compliant, because it's all happening behind the scenes. So, I'm a little confused. I know. <laughs> so you guys, you guys go into contract in the name of this new trust, and then the... the well, this is a joint venture on a note, but yeah, go but, ahead. But I'm saying, so, so the buyer then, the end buyer is coming in, and he's buying it, you know... He's buying the property for the purchase and sale agreement to ABC Land Trust, but he's only signing one note, and then <coughs> JV agreement actually splits up the note. And that's right. So, so nobody sees it. That's right. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> that's me. I'm and amazing. I really said flexibility and administrative ease. You know, the damn custodians are nosy as hell, right? And have you ever tried to explain a two-noter model to some little clerk that works in a, other than Quest, that works in a note department and doesn't even know what a note is, versus sending them a personal property trust and say, please, sign this personal property trust and send this money to this lawyer. It makes it so much easier to do your transactions. Isn't that right, Walter? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. What kind of stuff is recorded? Well, a note to so-and-so trustee of the such-and-such -such trust. No, it all happens behind the scenes. Okay, just sure. Okay, so let me let me pause it a situation. Let me, let me stop yelling. yelling. Stop yelling? I'm sorry. I'm so excited. I'm. Okay, but the really important part is with trust, everything depends on your trustee. Yes, that's true. So who are you using for trustee? Do you like have these rotating list of rows? Ask him. He sets all this stuff up. Walter, if I ask Hello. Quincy a question... Come over here, Walter. Get on the mic. What am I paying you for? Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's a hope of payment. <laughs> <laughs> Hurry up, Walter. All right, so uh, who's your trustee? Is that the question? Yeah. Right. I mean, it, I'm all, these trusts... By the way, we do have a whole course on trusts. 
and stuff. Well, we, Walter, he takes all the money and the credit. All right, so but we're going to we, give you, for all of you people in here, a trust implementation webinar series we did last year. We started about this time. I think there are eight episodes. How do you get that? Email me. All right, y'all know what it is. And we, we charge people for that, but it, it'll help you because it's not, it's not just land trust, personal property trust. But Walter, how do you pick, pick a trustee? Uh, you know where most of my trustees come from is sitting in a room just like this. Because you ought to be each other's trustee. Because most of you are not disqualified to the other person's IRA. Most of you. Because it's networking. It's financial friends. It's a team sport. Have I got the theories through? Have I got the main points across? All right, may I answer that question without him interrupting me once again? So I bought a house. Uh, while, actually, we closed on it while we were on the cruise, so that was three weeks That was ago. easy to do when we weren't there. Well, yeah, I, you don't have to show up for closing. I didn't sign anything at the closing. I didn't sign a check. I didn't sign any documents at the closing. None. Well, that's pretty cool, isn't it? So on the buy side. And even on the sell side, you don't sell anything. You don't sign anything. So you get somebody else to do it. So I had a wholesaler who called me up and said, look, we got this opportunity. It's an estate. You see the pattern? Estate. I'm dealing with the heirs, two of them. And they got this house. So he called me over because he wanted to get my feel of what the market is so he can make an offer to the owners. So we kicked the tires. It was a nice house, North Jackson. And I said, I'll pay you 40 for this house. So he says, okay. So we go back in, and he negotiates 36 with the owners right there on the spot. And they said, well, we got to think about it. I said, all right, they're going to call you back in a week. And they did, and they took the offer. All right, so it was a good, firm offer. And this is uh, a long story. <laughs> Are you going somewhere? <laughs> So we took title. Now, who do you think was my trustee? I'm answering the question. Well, I wish you'd hurry up. <laughs> Let's whip his ass. <laughs> Anybody in for that? <laughs> All right, so who do you think was my I'm answering your question. Who's the, the trustee? Wholesaler. The wholesaler. Oh, really? Yes. Mm -hmm. He wants to get paid, doesn't he? So he was the trustee of the title holding trust that acquired it. All right. So uh, I called up somebody said, look, I need 40. I didn't call Quincy. I said, I'll. I'll. <sighs> so we created 100 payment, 7.75%, $40,000 first. And I said, what I'll do, I don't care where that money comes from, but I'll sell you a one half interest option to buy the house. Uh -huh. now, we didn't have a buyer at this time, so I'm, we're introducing another concept here. I didn't have a buyer, I'm just, I'm just taking title. Well, during that time, I had one of my borrowers who called me up and said, Mama needs a house. And the reason she needs a house is because she got custody of her grandchildren because her daughter died in an automobile accident, and now mm -hmm. she needs a bigger house. So this was one borrower referred another borrower who referred another borrower on Normandy. They're going to buy that one, too. Okay. That ring a bell? Yep. All right, so think about what just happened. I got forty thousand plus five thousand dollars when I bought it, okay, and we have since sold it for sixty-two thousand with three thousand down, one hundred eighty payments. <coughs> so we converted that option to a note. To note. We converted an option to a note, and so the money guy, the forty thousand dollars is still being paid because we wrapped that when we sold it. So he got a $5,000 investment and ended up with one half of the wrap being the difference between 59 and 40. So that, effectively what happened is, if I can correct you, uh, not correct you, but understand, what happened is the money guy gets his money back either by sale of that first or by just keeping the first, and you guys split the profit. I that sold half the upside for a fee. Okay. And so she referred, I, I, I pay my borrowers referral fees of $500 if they bring me somebody else. That's part of my bill, recruiting allies. So she brought her sister in the deal who wants to buy a house nearby. That's how we, that's how we do it. That's it. That's how. So thank you. Um, so I, I know your wholesaler um, was the trustee. What was the percentage in the trust that you were paying the 
the trustee in that deal? Uh, so I didn't pay him anything out of the trust. You didn't pay him anything out of the trust. Mm -mm. Okay. I mean, a trustee can be a fee trustee or a not. A trustee right. should be paid something. In this case, he, there was a flip fee. Okay. He got $4,000. He got the $4,000, but there wasn't anything additional. I just wanted to make sure. Now, I, I'm not going to go into a lengthy discussion of who should be your trustee until you buy me some more liquor this evening. Okay. <laughs> okay. Give me your glass. But... That is a worthy discussion. We'll never get out of here if we uh, start discussing that because choosing your trustee is very, very important. And there are some things that I would recommend that you do and do not do, but I want to get through this presentation eventually. So we're going to go on. So you can see that, remember, we're dealing with the same scenario, $30,000 payment. I just put the amortization schedule. Everybody's got that, right? Okay. Now... What if I had only $250 in my daughter's inherited IRA and I needed $20,750 20, to do the deal and I found a money partner that said, you know, if I could make at least 10% on that deal, I'd be happy. Does that sound reasonable? Well, if I put, have this him or her or their IRA put up $20,750 for 54 payments of four eighty one thirty six. remember how we got there, right? Yeah then he would get a yield of 10.2581%. Is that what he asked for or more? More. more. Yes. That sounds good. And what am I putting in the deal? Nothing. No, 250 bucks. Okay, does that sound reasonable so far? Now, how does this work out math-wise? On the cash flow, he gets 54 payments for 481.36 for 25,993.44, or a profit of 5,243.44. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. And again, I just gave what they asked for. 10% is pretty high. I could probably get less. But I was fun. I like to use things that are real examples and see how that might work out. So that's his profit of 5243.44. He's got 72.95% of the note, because this is a joint venture. There's one note in this case, right? He's got 21,885.83 of the note which gives him 72.95%. Everybody's following this so far? Yes. So what about me? What is, uh, I'm sorry, what, is, uh, what do I get? I get zero, I get $250 outlay. Remember how we did that on the calculator? And I get zero for 54 payments, and then I get 26 payments of 4136. That gives me an annualized yield of 73.46% including the time that I'm not getting anything because my money's being reinvested. Does, do you like this scenario? Oh, yeah. Okay, and this was just done on the 10B2 or 10BII, if you guys want to call it that. And this chart can be created and emailed or printed to PDF or anything like that on that program. It's really slick. So I can show this to the investor if I need to, right? So my cash flow then is 4,136 times 26, or 12,515.36, minus my 250, of course. <laughs> Leaves me a profit of 12,265.36. What do you guys think of that? Is that okay? The point of the example is I gave the, the money partner in the deal what they wanted and more, and I still made a profit of $12,000 on the deal. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so now we'll move on. I thought about this and I thought, that's really cool, isn't it? Then I thought, that would be really great for a Coverdell education savings account. Do I, you think I have a theme here? Because I'm an idiot, because I should have thought about this before. If I had done that and they had waited 54 payments and I'd done that when they were my daughter was a freshman in high school or uh, not, whatever eighth grade or whatever that would have been ideal wouldn't it yeah. right so I thought well wait a minute my daughter's already in college at a very expensive university which according to Therese I shouldn't be sending her to <laughs> so I thought to myself I thought to myself what if Instead of, what if, I, well, listen to me, what if instead of 
my money partner getting paid first? What if I get paid first or the Coverdell gets paid first? Because yes. I need the damn money now. I don't need it four and a half years from now. I need it now. This could work for an inherited IRA too, by the way, right? I need the money now, so how does I work? There ought to be a way to figure out how to get my partner, my money partner, the desired yield and get me paid first. Now that sounds like an impossible sales job to do to somebody who's going to let you use their money because they think they get nothing, don't they? But do they get nothing? Not at all. Let's, let's review. So in this scenario too, proposal number two is I get paid first. Uh, and I get paid the first 16 payments. So my partner is going to put out 20750 get nothing for 16 months, and then get 64 payments instead of 54 payments. Everybody see that? Because I've taken my profit up first. And that gives him a yield of 10.12% even during this 16 months. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Yeah. The yields are calculated on the whole time period not just the time period you're getting cash. You see how powerful this concept is? But you have to show them visually to make this thing work. Because if they don't see it, they go like, what the hell are you talking about? Why would I let you get paid the first 16 payments? Because it's a great deal for you. Okay, let's see how it works. So they get 481.36 times 64, not 54, but 64 payments. That gives them 30,807.04 minus their 20,750 investment, that's 10,000, that's almost double, 10,5704. How would you like to double your investment, sir? Well, is that okay? Well, okay, well, is that fair to me? I get less. They're gonna say, no, 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 that, why would I do that? Because I'm not getting anything, but that's not true. Because what's happening is, first of all, to get them the the discounted rate that they need, I've got to give them a discount up front. I've got to give them 22705 of the note, right? And what happens, so if they pay it off immediately, they get an immediate bump. And instead of getting 20750 they get 22705 But every month, the interest is earned, added to the principal, earned, added to the principal, earned, added to the principal. Now, instead of being stupid and collecting those little inter monthly interest payments, they're reinvesting their money and getting interest on interest. Does that sound like a better position to be in? And so if you want to visualize this, this is what happens. This is the initial discount. Then the balance goes up until the 54 months, and then it amortizes as normal. Now, would you have ever in your imagination figured this out? Because visually, if you tell somebody, you're not going to get paid until I get paid first, that's a lousy deal. If you show them this chart, they go, really? Wow. Is either deal good for me? Well, let's see how it works for me. In this case, I'm getting paid first, so I own 24.32% of the note which happens to be 72.94.86, and I get my 16 payments up front, so that's what I get, and they get the rest, right? So my cash flow is 16 payments up front, 77.01.76, minus my 250 investment leaves me with 74.51.76. That's okay, right? How much did I have in this deal? 250 dollars. So what do you think my yield is on this investment, guys? 2,310.52. You're a thief. You're a thief. You're a crook. Am I a thief? No, wait. Let's analyze this. Am I a thief? Or did I give them a great deal exactly what they wanted? Is that something? Is that worth staying around for? What do you think? But is that the only way you could do it? Yes. No. If you could, but wait, there's more. But that's not the only way you could. What if you just can't overcome the objection of, I'm not getting anything for 16 months? Can you still do the deal? Sure, you can say, okay, 
well, we'll just give you your 10%. And that I'll amortize at 3, 3, uh, 66, 3, 56, 41 a month. And I'll just keep the rest, right? So your cash flow looks like this. 80 payments to 356, 41. That's 28,512.80 minus your 20,750 gives you 77,6280, right? Okay, that's fine. And what do I get out? Uh, they own 74% of the note, I own the rest. 77, 87, 26. So I get 9,996 in payments minus my 250, a profit of 9,746. Now in all three cases, did I screw anybody? Did I give them exactly what they wanted? Do they have a knowledgeable partner to deal with? Who's gonna take care of the problem if there's a problem? Okay, do you understand all this? And do, do I really care which of those scenarios they pick? You've heard the deal of three offers on real estate, correct? How many people follow that, three offers on real estate? Now you can make three offers on the use of somebody else's money to joint venture in a note. Yes, good, no, bad? So let's review. In proposal number one, my money partner is paid first and he makes 52, 43, 44 over 54 months, correct? I get paid the rest and I make 12,265.36 as we went over, right? And the total profit on the deal is 17,508.80. You following with me here? Yep. Now, what is this number? What is it made up of? Interest. Interest and discount. So there's $9,000 worth of discount and interest at 7.75%. And the combination gives us, our, gives us our yield. So we've decided in this case to divide it up for the money partner gets his back first. Proposal number two, the money partner says, no, 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 I'll take second place. But it's not really second place, but it's a joint venture. So he, I want to try to make $10,000, in which case I only make seventy-four fifty-one seventy-six. The profit, wait a minute. It's exactly the same. All we were doing is realigning the deal to make it work for us. Or the third proposal is that he makes 77.62.80 over 80 months, and I make 97.46 over 80 months because we're splitting the cash flow in the, down the middle, not down the middle, splitting the cash flow through the note for the whole 80 months. So that's the scenario in a trust. In a trust. So nobody knows what's going on. Now, is that... Okay, I'm sorry, that's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Now I got one more thing to show you. It's okay, right? Of course, good. I knew it was. <laughs> so I want to show you also the calculation of yield and tell you one more story, and then I'll shut up probably, well, probably not. But <laughs> anyway, I made a loan to show you how to, the difference in when you're reselling property that you foreclose on. This is a story about that, right? So. I loaned $200,000, I'll keep it short, I loaned $200,000, it was 12% interest and two, two points up front, so it was a payment of, of course, $2,000 a month, 1% per month, everybody got that? Yep. And I won't tell you the long story, but I foreclosed on the property, okay? And they had a tenant paying $3,500 a month who was operating a dog kennel business on the property, okay? So when I foreclosed, I immediately went from getting 2000 a month to 3500 a month, but I had to pay the taxes and insurance, which were about $500 a month. So I was netting, instead of 2000 a month, 3000 a month. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. So that's not bad. So I, the tenant seemed like a nice guy, so I leased it to the tenant for almost two years, and he paid his rent every month, 3500 a month for two years, and then I sold it to him for $350,000 with 6% interest. I know you're thinking, Quincy, 6% interest, are you wacky? But I sold it to him on a 15-year amortization with a five-year balloon and payments of $29,53.50. Now, assuming the cost of the insurance and taxes were the same, 
What has he proved to me over the last two years? He's reliable and he could afford what? 3500 a month. So what I was trying to do is create a what? A win-win scenario, right? Am I you following this, right? So I gave him 100% seller finance. Effectively, his down payment was the approximately $70,000 that I made over the last two years. Everybody follow that? So why in the hell would I give him a loan at 6%? And what's my yield on the loan? Well, let's figure it out. 18%. Because Don wants me off the stage. 18%. So this, of course, is the calculation. $350,000, 12 payments a year, 6%, 180 months, 29.53.50. Everybody got that right? Now, at 60 months, he'll owe me $266,031. Now, I only had how much into the deal? 200. 200. So I get five more years of payments and I still get a $66,000 profit after that. Does that sound reasonable to you? Now, what if I had wanted to sell it to him for 10% interest? Would I have had, would that be fair? I mean, a seller finance, 100% seller finance. What I would have had to do either a longer term or I would have had a less price. So that would have looked like this. I could have gotten a 10% or approximately 10% at 275000 And then the problem is that he would owe me what? 223000 at 60 months. Now, if he pays the loan out the whole time, all 180 months, let's say I renewed his, his uh, note at five years, and he, I probably would because he's pretty stable, right? Does it make any difference in the end to what I make on the deal? No. No. Well, it does, but it doesn't. What's the difference? What is the difference? It's not the, re well, the refi, I've already given you that hint. What else is the difference? Think about it for a minute. What is the interest calculated, what is the interest taxed at? No, what's the interest taxed at? Income. Ordinary income. What's the capital gains taxed at? Long-term capital gains tax at 20%. So what have I done in addition to not being greedy and making sure he has a win? What else have I done? I'm going to create the same amount of income, but I've lowered my taxes by increasing the capital gains and lowering the interest rate. And for some reason, I just felt in my heart that you guys needed to see that. Because once again, that's tax planning thrown into the whole amortization. So what's my yield on the note is over 16% because I didn't pay $350,000 for the income stream. I paid $200,000 for the income stream. And the 16% is made up of which two elements? The 6% interest and the 150,000 profit. That is other than talking about issues that I sense Dawn wants me to get off the stage. So I won't do that, but I'm willing to do it tonight. And my final thought is, please, open a self-directed IRA today. Perfect. Okay. Yes. Was that awesome? Okay. Okay. No, I haven't okay. finished this. Anyone who, does anyone need one of these? If you don't have a self-directed, can you help me get those out? Oh, yeah. Somebody? There's a bunch of these in the garbage okay. can. Do you guys need them? <laughs> 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 that was now, was that too repetitive for everybody? No, that was awesome. Hey, Walter, is there anything else that you want to All right, we're, yeah, I'll take that. Thank you. Oh, stay up here. Oh, thank you. Okay, let's point this out. The way he's putting deals together, is he going to a Fanat or uh, AmeriFunds? No. No. Where's their money coming from? Financial Friend Network. Would this work with somebody who didn't know them and trust them and love them to death? No. It would not. So the most powerful thing, people go, what's the quickest way for me to get in the note business? <laughs> right. Well, well, the... Give his phone number. Friends with benefits. Not with Quincy, though. Why not? It depends on how female and attractive you are. <laughs> Oh, wait, erase that part. <laughs>
okay, let's just let's just make this point. Um, so so if you, you heard what it took to be a really kick ass note broker from Abby. Did that seem like he's a pretty high level guy? Yeah. Employing a lot of stuff and a lot of capital, right? A lot of intellectual, a lot of you know personal resources. You know you can do that. It's a business. Um, the easiest way to get started in the note business is to develop financial friends. So the thing is, you could go right now from a variety of us in this room, and wouldn't it be super easy, brain dead easy, to get eight percent from somebody. That it's a really safe no. Absolutely. So do you even have to be really great at sourcing deals? No. But so what you need is someone who's making 1% or less, who's going to be happy with 5%, and they trust you. So you get 8%. They put up all the money at 5%. You are in the note business keeping a 3%. Don't hold those down there. A little higher, please. Put <laughs> <laughs> that on camera. Say it to his wife. <laughs> Can you see how, how, like, with none of your own money, yes. you spending the time to be in rooms like this, can you see how you can have passive income out of thin air on top of other people's money? And based on Dawn's reaction, how do you like to grow? Sit, sexy, thin, and rich with self-directed IRAs, because obviously Woo! it works. Hold me back. Be still my beating heart. Uh, by the way, thank you, Don. And by the way, if I have a very few. I don't have enough for everybody, but if you're kind of serious about opening an account, this has some uh, educational materials on it. It has our forms, articles, and things like that. So there's a few of those over there. And if anybody wants a pig, they'll have to just let me know.